on Business Incorporated today. Morocco textile export to Europe increases by 23% compared to last year. The International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation grants Côte d'Ivoire 10 million euro grants. East African community to clear overdue salaries and allowances. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa. First, let's start with the market on the African continent. We saw more of greens at intraday amongst the markets that we track. Nigeria's NGX had the highest gain, 0.15%, followed by JSE in South Africa up 0.12%. The market in Egypt was down 1.79%, while Kenya market closed in the green on Monday 1.61%. In the Middle East, all the markets were negative at intraday. In the UAE, the Abu Dhabi market shed 0.15%, while Dubai financial market was down 0.73%. Elsewhere, the Tadao of Saudi Arabia lost 0.04%, and in Qatar, the market was lower 0.13%. Moving over to Europe now, stocks were muted this morning with investors keeping a close eye on the oil market after talks between members of OPEC Plus Oil Producing Alliance were abandoned. For another happenings in the region, here is Conrad Vusen in Frankfurt. Hello, Conrad. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ini. Good to see you again and great to be back on Channel TV. Great to have you too. So COVID-19 crisis seems to have accelerated a phenom phenomenon that was in the making for a while, reshoring. Companies are bringing back parts of their industrial production, among other things, to be less dependent on foreign suppliers. Where is Europe in this? Well, it started a couple of years ago already. Uh, you know, the first uh, companies coming back from China were Stiel. It's a maker of uh, chainsaws. Also, Steif, the company that produces these uh, little animal animals that you can cuddle with and that kids love to play with. They came back from China because they were not happy about the quality that the workers there developed. And they didn't manage to increase the quality standards themselves. So. They decided, no, this is too expensive for us. We go back to Germany and produce here again. Uh, more and more companies are considering this because also there's enough, well, there's not enough skilled workers, but if you find skilled workers, you can find them on the labor market here in Germany, and that's uh, another reason. All right, so manufacturing has been strong in Germany. Now hopes are for a return of services. How many jobs can be created with reshoring? Well, the hope uh, is that there are many new jobs being created, particularly welcome, of course, would that be in uh, northern Italian uh, regions that had lost uh, many jobs beforehand, like Milan, like Turin. They are now looking forward to a better job situation. Also, of course, in Germany, I mean, we have a strong labor market. Uh, it's barely budged uh, during the pandemic and the lockdowns because of our furlough schemes or short-time work schemes that allowed people to stay in their jobs, earn a little less, but um, still uh, remain employed. Mm. So Germany is also lifting COVID-related travel ban on people from the UK and four other variant heat countries. What factors were considered before this decision? Well, we have to ask Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson, who met a couple of days ago in uh, the United Kingdom and who talked about uh, restrictions and whether or not it is time to, you know, lift them all. That's what uh, Boris Johnson has announced for the 19th of uh, July. Uh, Merkel was more skeptical. She said she's not convinced whether this is not a bit too early and whether, uh, you know, we should all consider a potential new wave of infections with uh, particularly this, um, this new variant of the virus. All right, so we'll see how that goes, especially as UK counts down to July 19th. Thanks so much, Conrad, and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. So we move over to London now, where, of course, the British are counting down to Freedom Day. But Juliana is here to give us updates on that. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Annie. 
So while you guys are counting down to July 19, UK watchdog warns that pandemic, climate change and rising debts pose fiscal risks. How has the market reacted to this warning? Yeah, it's a pretty interesting report. It's uh, been commissioned uh, by the government's own fiscal watchdog body, the Office for Budget Responsibility. They do these fiscal reports annually, but um, this one has particular interest because, of course, we're just slowly getting out of um, the pandemic. So it's really a worst-case scenario report. Last year, of course, GDP uh, plunged by almost 10 percent, the most in any um, uh, advanced economy across the world. And even though we are set um, to bounce back this year, the OBR have said they expect there to be, for at least uh, the next decade, a 2 percent permanent scarring of the economy. They also really focused on climate change. The climate emergency is a major topic of discussion amongst the G7 nations and G20. And this really kind of accelerated during the, climate, the Paris Climate Change Summit in 2015. Uh, the government have set a goal uh, to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. And the OBR say that uh, this is essential because if we don't do this, then it is going to cost um, the government billions upon billions of pounds. They did focus on a lot of other uh, key areas, including public debt. We know public debt in the UK currently stands at uh, nearly 100% of GDP. That's at two uh, trillion pounds. Lots of the government schemes that have been used to mitigate against the economic um, uh, fallout for consumers is going to start winding down in September. What happens then? What happens uh, with inflation? We know it's on the upward trend at the moment. Bank of England governor, as well as um, the Federal Reserve uh, Chair Jerome Powell, still think it's transitory, uh, but it may not be. So those are the kind of details uh, that uh, were outlined in the report. And the FTSE took it badly within the square mile. They are concerned, particularly as even though, yes, we are celebrating that perhaps we could once again be free on July the 19th, the Delta variant is um, a big cause for concern. So at intraday, the all-share is down 0.09%. The FTSE 100 is down by 0.14%. And the FTSE 250, that domestic market, slightly down at 0.08%. In the currencies market, the British pound is also down, down on the US dollar by 0.03%. Up, though, on the euro by 0.12%, but down on the Japanese yen at 0.17% at intraday and E. Mm, and the UK faces £10 billion spending shortfall on health, education and transport. Obviously, this is connected to the pandemic. What, de what details do you have? Well, yeah, this is all part of the same Office uh, for Budget Responsibilities fiscal report. So, yes, they were looking at debt. Yes, they were looking at the climate emergency. And they also looked at the medium to long term uh, fallout from COVID-19. Um, the new health secretary, Sajid Javid, has just been talking about some of um, the, the problems and the issues and the backlog uh, that the NHS has had because of the pandemic, particularly uh, when it relates to cancer patients. So many um, uh, um, uh, uh, surgeries and emergency treatments have been pushed back. And the OBR have um, outlined that these are areas of serious concern, money that was supposed to be put in to level up the country in areas such as education, infrastructure, rail, roads, hospitals. If it isn't um, uh, sorted out and money isn't budgeted towards these areas, then over the next three to five years, it could cost uh, the taxpayer um, the tune of uh, £10 billion. Pounds. So it's all part of um, this uh, fiscal report. I'm sure the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Shunak, uh, will be um, uh, responding to some of the urgent questions that the Labour Opposition Party are likely going to be putting to the Prime Minister and himself um, tomorrow morning. Uh, but as we saw, uh, the square mile did react uh, pretty badly, but this was um, uh, published uh, by the government in order to try and uh, uh, mitigate against some of these worst case scenario um, objectives. All right, thank you so much, Juliana, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. So we move over now to Asia, where shares in major Asian Pacific markets struggled for direction as investors reacted to the Australian central bank's interest rate decision. The Nikkei 225 in Japan rose 0.16% to close at 28,643.21, while the Topics Index advanced 0.28% to end the trading day at 1,954.50.
Over in South Korea, the Kospi gained 0.36% on the day to 3,305.21. Mainland Chinese stocks, on the other hand, closed lower. The Shanghai Composite slipped 0.11% to 3,530.26, while the Shenzhen component dipped 0.34% to about 14,667.65. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index fell around 0.2% as of its final trading hour. Meanwhile, the S&P AX200 closed 0.73% lower at 7,261.80. MSI Broadest Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan rose about 0.1%. And in the U.S., stock futures were flat in early morning trading as Wall Street gets set to kick off the holiday shutting week with the S&P 500 at a record high. Futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose just about 50 points. S&P 500 futures were flat and Nasdaq 100 futures were a tad lower. West Texas intermediate crude rose above $76 a barrel, while S&P 500 is coming off a seven-day winning streak, its longest since August, amid a string of solid economic reports, including a better-than-expected jobs report on Friday. The tech-heavy Nasdaq composite also reached a record high in the previous session. Still, many on Wall Street expect smaller and choppier gains from the rest of the year after strong performance in the first half I mean, a historic economic reopening. The S&P 500 is up nearly 16% year-to-date. Investors await the release of June Federal Open Market Committee meeting, which is due tomorrow, for clues about the central bank's behind-the-scenes discussion on winding down its quantitative easing program. The oil market now prices rose slightly today after the previous day's rally, supported by expectations of a tighter market as output talks of OPEC plus nations were called off, and concerns that members may start to increase production capped gains. Brent crude was up seven cents to seventy-seven dollars twenty-three cents a barrel after gaining one point three percent yesterday. U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures were at seventy-six dollars thirty-eight cents a barrel, up one dollar twenty-two cents from Friday's close. OPEC plus called off oil output talks and said no new date to resume them after clashing last week when the United Arab Emirates rejected a proposed eight-month extension to output curves, meaning no deal to boost production has been agreed. Iraqi minister says his country is committed to the current agreement with OPEC and its allies and does not want to see oil prices soaring above current levels to achieve stability. In the metals market now, gold prices were hovering close to a two-week high today held by a subdued dollar while investors awaited minutes from the U.S. Federal Reserve's June policy meeting for more clarity on monetary policy going forward. Spot gold was steady at $1,792.34 per ounce after hitting its highest since June 18 at $1,794.86 on Friday. U.S. gold features rose 0.5% to $1,792. A weaker greenback makes gold less expensive for holders of other currencies. Because this week is on minutes from the Fed's latest meeting due tomorrow, after a hawkish tilt from the U.S. Central Bank surprise market last month. Silver edged 0.1% lower to $26.44 per ounce. Palladium gained 0.3% to $2,820.70 a bar. An ounce and platinum climbed 0.5% to $1,102.05. After the break, we we'll look at commodities market space as well as other developments on the African continent. Do stay with us. It's Business Incorporated on Channels Television. Welcome back to Business Incorporated on Channels Television. Now, on Commodities Markets Update, we're looking at the Paris Agreement, which is a landmark international accord that was adopted by nearly every nation in 2015 to address climate change and its negative impact. With the Paris Climate Accord and renewed clamor for cleaner energy, there's a growing threat to oil as a source of energy and OPEC as a cartel in the marketplace. One country that's taken advantage of this situation is Chile. What lessons can Africa learn from Chile? Shei Omidiora, analyst with financial derivatives company, summarizes this in our next conversation. Hello, Shei. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. 
You're welcome. Well, Chile has put together an ambitious plan for renewable energy, which will further impact the drive for sustainable energy. If Chile continues along this path and other countries follow in its footsteps, what are the high points of their plan? And what would be the potential and implication for countries like Nigeria and other oil producing states? Well, the first thing we need to remember is that this threat to oil and OPEC as a cartel is not new. It has been existing for a while. And of course, we can say it's been a lot more, this drive has been a lot more aggressive since the pandemic began. And since um, Joe Biden was elected president of the free world, and he brought um, the U.S. back to the Paris Accord table. Now, but I believe there are two questions we really need to ask ourselves. One, um, how easily can we make this commercial, com commercially viable, um, especially as a lot of these initiatives are still in the early stages of development? And two, how can we effectively um, move the world, shift the world away from um, systems that are heavily reliant on carbon-based fuels? But generally, what we believe we are going to see, especially in the short term, is as more and more countries move away from carbon-based fuels, carbon or oil-based states are most likely going to decrease their investment in oil production. And a second order effect of that will most likely be a short-term increase in oil. But long-term, what we are likely to see, especially for countries that are at the forefront of this um, rotationing away from carbon-based fuels into alternative energy is there will be significant benefits. But for countries that lag, what will likely be the effect is that we are um, decreased um, revenues and subsequently a decrease in foreign exchange earnings. And this always is going to be spells bad omens for the countries that will be caught in this lag. So um, at this time, clean hydrogen is an important way to decarbonize heavily pollut polluting industries like long distance transport. When we consider this now, what should Nigeria be doing differently to take advantage of alternative sources of energy and what will be the impact of such on an alignment? Yes, so we are well aware that Nigeria still flares a lot of its natural gas. And this, of course, translates to us not maximizing our natural gas reserves. Now, as we all know, um, hydrogen, clean hydrogen is produced primarily by reforming natural gas. And this, again, um, spells the importance of looking away from carbon-based fuels into natural gas and also us as a country um, maximizing our natural gas reserves. Now, this is something the government can look into and um, maybe through regulatory action or through incentives, um, implore a lot of the um, oil-based states to look into um, investing in infrastructure that we can use to produce um, clean hydrogen. Again, clean hydrogen, um, this method, um, reforming natural gas is actually one of the cheapest ways, or is, in fact, is the cheapest way of producing clean hydrogen. It's also the most common way. So um, flaring gases is, of course, not a sustainable way. And of course, we should always look towards um, building infrastructure that we can use to um, transport. And subsequently, um, after we have established that, then we can look towards building export infrastructure as well. And this will always, of course, um, if we want to sell to international markets, we can always prop up our foreign exchange earnings as well. Nigeria ranks second in the world among countries with high deforestation rates, about 54%. Do you think Nigeria should embark on aggressive reforestation exercise, especially with the increased encroachment of the desert and the open grazing controversy? Yes, so we are well aware of the deforestation rates. Of course, it's, it seems interesting. It seems like an interesting conversation because um, of the fact that when we look at our immediate environment, we might see loads of vegetation and shrubbery. But in the real sense of it, it doesn't make us um, appreciate the gravity of the situation. Of course, we know that um, these conversations are not front and center, and we don't really see the effect it has on um, things like our food security and the overall health of our climate. 
Now we saw that um, the Lake Chad Basin, for instance, has depleted about 90% since about um, since 1950, has depleted by about 90%. A lot of its water is gone now, and this, of course, has led to displacement, and subsequently, um, jobs have been lost. People cannot fish as well. And recently, we also saw Gabon, and um, the first African country to receive carbon credits for um, decreasing its um, carbon emissions. They subsequently got a $17 million payment from CAFI. And this um, was because we were able to mitigate carbon emissions. So this, of course, should lead to load, load, um, a lot more conversations about decreasing carbon emissions in Nigeria. And especially, we should be looking towards um, planting new trees or planting trees where um, trees used to be and which have subsequently been de depleted, maybe because of um, increase in um, real estate investment, for instance. So I believe this is, um, this is something, this is an exercise that Nigeria should aggressively embark upon. All right, and we really do hope that authorities are listening and then we'll see action towards that. Thank you so much, Shay, and have a lovely day ahead. Thank you very much. So it's not just Gabon that is uh, um, enjoying uh, emissions credits. Kenya's largest utility says its certified emission reduction credit, CERS, available for sale, had more than doubled to over 550,000. CER, CER is equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide, and they're part of emission reduction efforts under the Kyoto Protocol. Kenya Electricity Generating Company says it has an additional 309,495 CER certified under United Nations guidelines on climate change. It later CR under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change are from 105 megawatts power station. And moving on to Morocco. Now, Morocco's textile exports to Europe have risen by 23% to date this year compared to last year. Despite the pandemic, the country's textile industry offered 10,684 new jobs. Meanwhile, Moroccan pharmaceutical firm will soon start the production of 5 million doses a month of China's Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccine in the North African country. The Moroccan government also signed a deal with Sweden's Recifarm to set up a plant in Morocco to produce other key vaccines. And in Côte d'Ivoire, the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation, a member of the Islamic Development Bank Group, has granted a 10 million euro to finance Bridge Bank Group in Côte d'Ivoire. The facility represents a significant portion of BBCGI's remaining 2021 trade financing requirement and enables the group to support the bank's growing private sector clients as well as small to medium-sized enterprises. BBGCI Côte d'Ivoire's ninth largest bank by total asset will make the funding available to the bank's growing client base, especially importers operating in the sector such as energy, foodstuff, agribusiness and construction. And East African community has moved to clear salary and allowances owed to its employees and leaders through a supplementary budget that was presented on the 28th of June for approval. According to the supplementary budget, EAC organs and institutions, including the Secretariat members of Parliament and the Lake Victoria Basin, are owed more than $2.2 million in arrears. A supplementary budget that was presented on the 28th of June by the chairperson of the EAC Council of Minister of Kenya's Cabinet Secretary to plug the deficit reveals the East African Legislative Assembly members are still owed $252,000 million, I beg your pardon, in sitting allowances. The amount is part of sitting allowances arrears for the period between the months of March to June 2020. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching Business Incorporated. I'm Amy John Nekwa.